Um, but for, okay. But for efficiency reasons, we ended up deciding to work with Iris and Koch. So um, we decided if, if you're going to prove the algorithm, then you could try to do model checking, but you might as well go whole hog and try to prove as much as you can about it. And so it was very natural to consider Koch. And then amongst things in Koch, Iris, which I'm showing here, has a very good implementation of concurrent separation logic. And they've had lots of experience working with it. They've proven lots of programs. So it gave us a good basis to start, or so we thought. We didn't know how hard it would be. We didn't know what we get, we'd get out of the proof once we'd done it. But this was, this was the thinking that got us from, let's try to do apply verification to a microkernel to let's do some stuff with Koch, which was a surprising um, um, tack for me. Now, um, I want to stop sharing, but this isn't going very well here. Um, I'm gonna have to quit. Okay. I think Alexandra unshared me. Is that right? I unshared you, Peter, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Quentin. I would, I'm just gonna hand over to Quentin now um, yeah. to talk about the more technical aspects of the proof. Is this uh, going well? Are you seeing the my screen? Yes, it's okay. Cool. Um, so yeah. Um, so let, um, the first thing I'm going to to show you uh, um, an overview of the uh, of the actual IPCQ that we uh, we targeted. So the the first one is called the generic queue. And um, so multiple queues exist in the IPC subsystem of the operating system. And the generic queue is the first one that uh, came to life. And all the others are uh, derivatives of, uh, of this uh, initial implementation. It's also, it's also the simplest one. It's used in, uh, in uh, device drivers to uh, um, set up data pipelines. Um, and it's got a two-phase API, which I'm, I'm going to explain uh, in the next slide. And um, finally, it's using log-free concurrency, uh, log-free synchronization, I mean. So this means that instead of uh, uh, synchronizing the, the operation, the queue operations using, uh, say, a mutex, uh, the implementation uh, never grabs logs and uh, instead uses a uh, uh, primitive uh, C11 atomic operation to, uh, to implement the synchronization. So that makes the, the algorithm uh, subtle and that makes uh, Iris uh, very relevant to, for the proof. So the, the goal of the two-phase API, which I, I mentioned, uh, is to enable clients to implement so-called zero copy pipelines. So in uh, Peter's example, uh, pointers were being passed around, but, uh, but it, this is slightly different. Uh, what we want to do here is uh, that the data structure gives to uh, the user a pointer to its internal buffer, and then the user will uh, write uh, data in the internal buffer. And then when some data has to be consumed, it will be read uh, of the internal buffer. And, and the idea is that um, if you have to build a complex value, well, you just build it in place in the internal queue buffer. And so you don't lose uh, precious time by like building your, your, your value uh, in a buffer, then copying it to the IPC buffer, and then copying it from the IPC buffer to the, to the consumer. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's the idea. Now I have an example, uh, code snippet here of a uh, client code. And here, what we're trying to do is to enqueue a value. So the first thing the client will do is call a start enqueue function. And that's uh, one half of the, of the enqueue. What it does is that it moves the current pointer in the queue uh, data structure, and it marks the, so here, the first cell as uh, unavailable. So that's, uh, that's why it's, uh, it's now red. Then uh, the cell uh, kind of below the ownership cell doesn't doesn't move. I mean, but the ownership of the cell uh, goes to the client code, and the client receives a pointer to this cell. So what the client can do is like 
set up the set up the value in directly in the cube buffer. So here it's just uh, writing the integer forty two in the in the cube buffer, and when um, when the value is written fully written, um, the client can call this mark ready function, and this will uh, make the cell that was unavailable uh, now available, so it's no longer red. And uh, in particular, it can be um, it can now be dequeued. So right uh, before when it was red, it was not available for dequeue because the value could be half constructed basically. So that's that's the two phase API. So um, the other queue that uh, that we verified is uh, the so called pods queue. So it's it's called like this because it just uh, it's a uh, it's the core of uh, the pods. Uh, kernel mechanism. And this mechanism is used uh, by the kernel to notify user processes that some uh, something happened. So this something could be some data is available on a data pipeline or an exception has happened. So an exception meaning like a segmentation fault in uh, Unix, for instance. Um, so that's, those. this is a lightweight uh, notification mechanism. And one additional feature that the pods queue has over the generic queue is that it supports reservation. So reservation is a mechanism by which you, you can ensure that later in the future, uh, your N queue is going to succeed. So, uh, and, and your N queue is, is not, well, at least it's not going to, to fail because the queue is full. So you claim a reservation early and then later on, when you start NQ and you use your reservation, you know it's uh, it's going to succeed. And why they implement this uh, mechanism is because in some places in the kernel, it's very difficult to handle errors. And so, <clears throat> so they take a reservation in a place where it's easy to to deal with uh, error cases. And when uh, deep down in the kernel, they need to NQ a message like on the pods on this pods queue. Um, they will use the reservation and be sure that uh, that the NQ cannot fail. So that's uh, so now it may look a little bit like the two-phase NQ mechanism, but it's it's very different because if you remember from the two-phase NQ, uh, the cell uh, between the start NQ and mark ready, the cell is unavailable. And so if you hold uh, a cell after a start NQ and wait for a long time before you mark ready. You may end up uh, deadlocking the entire queue, while a reservation will never deadlock the queue. So that's the that's the, the, the difference. Now another thing you may wonder about is uh, so why do we go through all this pain of uh, implementing a log free uh, um, log free data structure? And well, the first reason is to minimize non preemptible sections. So. The operating system that uh, Facebook is uh, developing is um, intended to, to be real time. And so we don't want to uh, grab a lock that would, for instance, disable uh, interrupts and uh, delay processing of uh, low latency uh, signals, basically. So another reason why we use log free concurrency is that um, gives us um, a light uh, synchronization mechanism because uh, the alternative would be, for instance, syscalls, where the user notifies that, uh, for instance, uh, it is done with a, with a port notification. And the notification would be a system call. System calls uh, incur what uh, we call context switches, and context switches are an expensive operation. So you'd much rather uh, write a, a bit to a memory location uh, in, your, in your address space than to uh, go through an expensive system calls, and so coming back on the uh, also on the on the first point, um, it, it turns out that while log free synchronization is tricky in itself, it's uh, uh, it gives um, it gives you um, a simpler system to reason about uh, at a global scale. So when you look at the queue itself, it's tricky to to get it right, but but if you know you have a queue and it's log free, it means you can interrupt it at any time, really, and you don't have to care whether uh, something is in progress or, or some operation is in progress or, or some other conditions. So when you introduce logs in the kernel, you kind of have to reason about these properties at a global scale. So uh, going with log free data structures 
uh, kind of simplifies actually the reasoning uh, for the global invariance of the operating system. So it's an interesting complexity trade-off. So I'm going to now uh, describe some of the, the technical tools that we use to, um, to specify this, uh, this log-free code. And um, so to, speci to specify sequential code, uh, this, is, uh, this is a well-known problem uh, and we have good solutions for it. So we may use like all logic. So here I have an example triple where I perform shift left uh, by one on the, on the variable A and store the result in B. And so uh, we have a precondition uh, that's uh, between curly braces uh, on the left hand side of the code snippet, uh, the code snippet and a post condition. So, and the intended meaning of, uh, of this triple is that if I start in a state that satisfies the precondition, I execute the code snippet, I will end up in a state that satisfies the post condition. And that works really well uh, for sequential code, but it it um, the story is not as clear uh, in presence of inter interferences. So, for instance, uh, what happens if a racing thread changes a uh, after the shift, but before gets b gets assigned? So, uh, say increments a by one, something like this. Then, uh, really, uh, if you have uh, if you have interfering inter interferences like this, the meaning of of the of the whole triple kind of uh, falls apart in this. Uh, in this somewhat adversarial uh, setting. So to, to solve this problem, we move to concurrent separation logic, which Peter uh, introduced in the first part of the talk. And so it inherits from separation logic, for instance, uh, features such as the separating conjunction, the frame rule. And uh, very importantly, it will use a uh, stable assertion. So this means that the, the what we, the predicates we have in uh, pre and post conditions are robust to interference. So in particular, they cannot, uh, um, they cannot really uh, mention uh, um, shared variables like we had in the, in the, in the example triple in the previous slide. And if, you, if we want to reason about shared state, state, we have to use global invariance. So this invariance uh, will are global properties that we can access, but only around atomic statements. So let's look at some derivable triples to uh, help build uh, an intuition of uh, CSL. So here I have, um, I have a triple where on the left side of the turnstile, I have a boxed uh, X even. So X even is my invariant. It's a global invariant. So it means like the, the, the shared variable X is even. Then uh, here I have an atomic load operation and uh, I will load from X and store the result in A. Then uh, this triple that says that uh, if I load X into A, uh, A, is, uh, A is even, uh, is, uh, is valid the derivable triple because we can use the invariant to prove that A is even after the load. Another, um, more interesting triple is this one where we first load X uh, into A. So A is a local variable, it's not shared. And, um, and then we store in X uh, two plus A. So because, because A is even after the load and we, uh, we store uh, two plus A, which is also even into X, uh, then the invariant is, uh, is preserved. And, um, and so, so this triple can, can be derived. So now it's it's not the same as bumping x by two in an atomic fashion because there may be a racing thread that changes the value of x in the middle of the of the two statements. But to show one one triple that doesn't work is uh, this one where we add one to x atomically, then again do it do it another time, and. Um, so that doesn't work because in the middle, uh, after the first addition, X is now odd and invariants are a global resource. So this means that another thread uh, in the middle of the two atomic adds could be relying on the fact that uh, X is even. And if it turns out not to be even, then uh, I mean, the logic is unsound basically. And so this triple is not derivable unless uh, you have a trivial uh, precondition that uh, 
say false or that makes makes your entire triple uh, unusable. So formally, uh, we use uh, this INV inv rule uh, to to open global invariants in concurrent separation logic. So the, the rule, as I showed it here, is from IRIS. Uh, that's the implementation of separation logic we use. So it, very importantly, we have the side condition that the command that we we want to prove a triple on is a uh, has to be atomic so we cannot we cannot open the invariant unless the command uh, in the triple is atomic the invariant can also only be open once uh, so you can see it, it's on the left hand side of the turnstile below the bar but below, uh, above the bar it's a uh, it's now gone and it's uh, kind of moved in the pre and post condition but uh, we can uh, we can only uh, open invariant once in the derivation the so in the precondition uh above the bar the invariant is now available so there's a there's a, a triangle uh symbol that's a so-called later modality that's a, that's a technicality of of iris but we we can pretty much ignore it for the for the purpose of this talk so the invariant is available in the precondition so for instance if the command is atomic load then uh, uh we know that uh, uh, and and the invariant is that x is even we know uh, that x is even before running uh, running the atomic load uh, now the we can open the invariant but we have to uh, restore it when the command is done here uh, so we require that it's also uh, in the post condition and the, the whole rule uh, only works because the command is atomic and so interferences are impossible So it's um, it, it may look underwhelming, but uh, it's actually a surprisingly powerful rule because uh, if the logic is expressive enough, invariants can uh, can mention uh, fairly rich protocols. And in Iris, uh, what we use to uh, to have rich invariants is uh, called ghost state. We are not going to go over it in the talk, but uh, but this command is a uh, is actually I mean this this. This rule is uh, is actually surprisingly powerful. It's it's got a defect though, and the defect is that it doesn't really enable you to build abstractions. Uh, and by this, I mean that we will only ever be able to open invariants uh, all over atomic commands. And and what our goal with the with the IPCQs was really to to provide a, a neat. Uh, uh, a neat API and a neat specification to the queue operations. And really, from the user's point of view, uh, we would like the queue operations to appear like they are atomics. So, uh, so we would like to provide the illusion that even though the, the queue operation is implemented by a sequence of, uh, of uh, statements, we'd like to provide the illusion that, uh, that like the NQ and DQ uh, happen atomically. So to provide this illusion, we use a notion uh, called uh, logical atomicity. And in Iris, uh, it's uh, expressed using logically atomic triples. So it looks very much like a whole triple, but we use this uh, slightly different notation. And um, intuitively, it means uh, that during the execution of the command C, there is an atomic step S for which uh, PSQ, the triple PSQ, so this time the normal, uh, CSL triple PSQ holds. And so there, there is a single step over which a single atomic step over which um, the, the triple holds. And this step is called the linearization point of the operation or the commit point. So now uh, that's, that's a bit technical. And so he, but, um, but because uh, the linearization point happens kind of at an unknown time, we need a binder in the logically atomic triples to mention uh, the state that is currently like unknown when we call push, but uh, but that will uh, become the the logical state of our uh, of our data data structure at the linearization point. And uh, so here I, we have a triple for push, uh, just a push uh, for a concurrent stack, 
and it's saying that uh, so there is this fall L binder that actually scopes over the precondition and the postcondition. It's a bit of a confusing notation, but uh, I think it's standard. Um, and it says that regardless of what the logical state of the stack is before the linearization point, after the linearization point, it's going to be uh, uh, X cons L. So we are going to happen X to the beginning of the logical state of the, of the stack. So logical atomicity uh, comes with uh, proof rules in Iris, and we'll uh, go over two uh, very important ones. So the first one is that a logically atomic triple is strictly stronger than a, than a general Hall triple. And this is uh, uh, reflected in this rule that says, uh, if, if one has a logically atomic triple for comment C, then uh, we can derive the normal uh, CSL triple out of it, uh, kind of for free. Also, logically, atomic triples allow opening invariants, and that's that's really the most important thing about them. Is that uh, here we have a rule that is LA inv that is very similar to the inv rule we had before, but uh, we no longer have the side condition that C must be atomic, and so and so the user can think of the command C uh, as a single atomic uh, command. And in particular, invariance can be opened around the command. And this, this, like, this allows uh, reasoning about the uh, confront uh, objects. So yeah, C may not be a single atomic step here. So with, with all of this uh, in mind, uh, we can now look at, uh, at a spec. Uh, so it's, it's uh, one of the specs uh, of, the, of, the Q, of the NQ path. So here we look at the start NQ function and the spec, so it's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, they are all structured in a, in a very uh, very similar way. So that we have first this EQ predicate and this EQ predicate simply relates the physical Q value Q with a logical name uh, for the Q instance. And here it's, uh, it's called gamma. So that's, that's a standard way to do things uh, in, uh, in Iris. Um, this EQ predicate is uh, is persistent. Uh, this means that it can be freely dupli duplicated in uh, in the, in the separation logic. And so, in particular, if multiple threads are using the same Q, we can split EQ into uh, as many threads are used as uh, uh, they are using the Q, and then send one EQ predicate to each of the threads. So it's so it's usually really not not a challenge to to get this ESQ uh, predicate uh, handy and, uh, and, and, and use the logically atomic step, uh, spec that follows. So there's a magic wand operator uh, from separation logic. And then we have the logically atomic triple that is uh, the most interesting part of the spec. So as I mentioned, uh, we use this binder here to quantify over the state of the Q uh, at the linearization point of the operation. So here, the, the state of the queue is uh, a list of slots. So it's not, it's not a list of values, as uh, one might expect. It's, uh, slots can be either locations or values. And this is because we have this, this state where a value, uh, we started to enqueue a value, but it's not fully enqueued yet because uh, it hasn't been uh, produced by the client code. And so we have to account for this uh, for this uh, in-between state. And, and that's when we use a location. So the, the location would be a, a pointer to an internal uh, cell, to a cell in the, in the Q buffer. Um, yeah, we, we have this Q content predicate that relates uh, the physical representation and the uh, and the logical representation. So the logical representation is just this list of slots, and um, so that's the only uh, component of the precondition. Then in the postcondition, uh, we bind over the return value, and uh, you can see we require that v equals uh, the pair k l. So the return value of stat and q is a pair of two uh, of two. Um, two values. The first one is uh, uh, some opaque index, which uh, is just going to be used uh, 
when calling uh, mark ready. And the second one is a pointer to the internal buffer. So that's uh, that's where we get the, the like the zero copiness of the data structure. Uh, we also get in the post condition an enqueuing predicate that is um, just a permission to call uh, mark ready. Um, maybe the most interesting part is that we get a pointer to the internal buffer, and this pointer uh, um, here it's a, it's a permission of a separation logic assertion L maps to, and then a wild card. So we can use this permission. Uh, in cl the client code can use this permission to then uh, um, verify uh, an assignment to to the location. And uh, finally, we, we also have the updated queue content. So you can see at the end of the queue content, we added the location L, and this is, uh, this is marking uh, the beginning of the, of the NQ operation. Then we, uh, we have the mark ready function. Uh, so in the mark ready function, uh, so it, it again follows the same pattern where uh, we have ESQ, magic wand, and then the logical the atomic triple. So we require in the precondition the enqueuing predicate, which we got out of uh, start NQ. We also require um, the points to uh, assertion, L points to V. Uh, and now we care about the value because the value here is the value that was written by the user. And so that's the thing, that's the value that must appear in the, in the logical state of the queue. And then uh, looking at the post condition, so the, what the post condition says is that uh, act, actually in the, in the queue content, in the logical content of the queue, there was uh, an index uh, i uh, such that si is, uh, is the location uh, that the user just wrote to. And so it's, it's saying, well, the NQ was indeed pending. And then in the post condition, what we get is, uh, the is the the queue content where we replace this location with the value that just got enqueued. So that's it uh, for Mark ready. So now we have this spec, and it's and it's kind of intricate. It's a bit, uh, and it's it's more subtle than uh, what you usually see when, for instance, you you do the iris tutorial and then you prove a. Uh, uh, you prove a concurrent stack, a uh, log-free concurrent stack. So, so we were we were kind of not sure if our specs were really usable. You know, we, we came up with them; they seemed reasonable. But how can we be sure that they actually uh, they would actually work? You know, in in the sense that uh, I, if I write a program on top of this uh, two-phase uh, Q API, uh, will I be able to to reason uh, effectively about it? So, so we decided to, to go a bit further and, and test the specification. And um, the way we did this is, uh, is rather simple. We, we took the two-phase uh, two queue, actually an arbitrary two-phase queue. And um, using the primitives of two-phase queue, we implemented a, just a regular queue. So the regular queue, the, those are the specs, not we're not going to really look much into them, but they, but they are much more straightforward. And they are also, um, uh, well, that's the kind of spec that you could find in an IRIS tutorial. So it's, so it's widely accepted that this is a very uh, reasonable spec for, uh, for Q operations. You can see, you can find them in many papers. So we were, we were um, the way our test worked was that we 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 take we took our fancy specs uh, of two phase queue and then by sequencing the two phase uh, so for instance to implement nq we just uh, we just uh, start nq then write the value to the pointer we got and then mark the mark the set ready and 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 we want to show that this nq uh, implementation uh, is the the one that uh, everyone expects and so while doing those do, doing this we didn't really we didn't have to look at the actual implementation of the two phase queue so we just uh, we just assumed but that we had available some piece of code that implemented the specs we've seen on the slides before and then using 
just the specs, we implemented this. Uh, we implemented this NQ and and proved that it was uh, it was um, matching the the specs here. So this this is kind of a testimony to the compositionality of logically atomic specifications. Um, we are able to to effectively verify software that is using uh, log free concurrency in a in a modular way so so it's really really a good thing and and really a, a strong strong clue that uh, i mean logically atomic specs are, are really uh, a useful useful concept so this this work uh, did not really end here with the verification uh, we 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 did find a couple of uh, code improvements uh, while uh, so I, I will now show you one so here you have the code uh, for the model of the stat dq and the parts that you see in gray were actually present uh, in the c implementation and were part of the initial model but we realized while doing the proof that uh, we're not really using them uh, in any way and so we just remove them and the proof goes through, like the start DQ, we can, we can, we can prove it just the same uh, by deleting this code. And, and that's, a, that's a couple of operations uh, in the middle of a, of a perform, performance sensitive uh, um, part of the code. So we were uh, pretty excited by this. And so we just went ahead and modified the C code um, and removed this, uh, remove this load and the check uh, from the C code. And when we did so, uh, we had a, a bit of a funny surprise uh, because we started observing failures in the continuous integration uh, system. So like what, what went wrong? Uh, and after, after an afternoon of uh, just uh, plain old debugging, we uh, realized that uh, Actually, a couple of device drivers were using the queue in an improperly initialized state, and the queue was not fully initialized, but uh, but it was uh, it was being used nonetheless. So um, we suggested one fix to uh, to the engineers, and they decided to do it another way. But uh, it ended up uh, like being uh, it ended up fixing the problem uh, as well. And um, yeah, what did I want to say? Yeah, well, you may you may be wondering. I mean, why why uh, the failures were not observed uh, with the extra check? And the reason is, uh, if you see, we we are loading from uh, the owner array uh, q dot own k, and then we are comparing uh, what we loaded to uh, this cons constant. So cons is meant to 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 mean a consumer. And cons, the cons constant happened to be uh, set to one. And if you read from an initialized memory, you usually get zeros out of it. And so the test was not passing. And when we removed them, uh, it was passing. So, um, so that's what uh, that's where the, the that's how the behavior change can be explained. It's a bit uh, <laughs> it's a bit underwhelming, you know, <laughs> but. Uh, but uh, it was a, it was a very interesting find, uh, nonetheless. We um, we also found some other modifications, uh, removed some memory barriers, but they are not uh, not really related directly to to the proof effort. Like we could not really verify that these optimizations were uh, were valid because Iris um, allows us to to reason in a sequentially consistent memory model, while we would need a relaxed memory model. Uh, yeah, uh, I see uh, that. Quentin, can I can I interrupt here? Yeah. Uh, Derek has a question. I'll let him ask it maybe directly. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, uh, a question. So uh, you see, you have these atomic loads here. So were you actually modeling atomics versus non-atomics, like in this in the like in style? Of no, language? no. Or this is like using heap lang and and this ignoring data races. No, using using heap lang, it's just an, it's just a regular load. But uh, in heap lang, all loads are atomic. <laughs> so, right, right. Okay, okay. So that's what I meant. Did you you didn't you didn't you didn't care about data races here? Um, we didn't care about what data races. Uh, no. Okay. Yeah, that's right. That's right. 
yeah so i have slides with the code but uh we don't have much much time uh so i decided to skip them but uh if if you have uh questions uh about the the code itself uh, we can definitely go through it uh, at the end and this is uh, close to the end um so i'd like to to conclude uh with a, a few um a few key points so we decided to prove the algorithm and peter motivated this uh well and not the code it, it really was quicker uh and um we could focus on the actual question of engineers so engineers were really interested in the correctness of the algorithm and the implementation uh could be uh, could have bugs but they were really more interested in knowing whether the, the fundamentals of the algorithm of the algorithm were sound and so by doing the proof on the algorithm we uh, we really answered their the question and it was it was we found the right cost benefit uh, for us uh, because we nonetheless uh, despite verifying the algorithm we were able to find simplifications in the actual code and also find bugs in uh, in the operating system so that that was a uh, um, pretty good uh, payoff so there are some limitations to our work uh, of course well the first one being that we prove the algorithm not the code um, it's also a pure safety proof so we're kind of uh, assuming everybody is playing by the rules while in in the in the kernel they are interested in so for the post queue for instance the cons the producer end is in the kernel and the uh, and the consumer end is in the user process and because they are communicating with shared memory they are really interested in knowing whether the the user uh, could um, i mean i don't know put the put the queue in a bad state and crash the kernel uh, so crashing the kernel would be one bad thing Another bad thing would be deadlocking the kernel, and and that's also one uh, one reason why uh, the queue is not uh, implemented using uh, by sharing the lock between kernel and, kernel and user space because the user space could just grab the lock and then deadlock the kernel forever. That's really something that uh, uh, that they don't want. Um, yeah, some uh, other limitation is of course uh, the fact that. Uh, what Peter mentioned that uh, the code uh, is changing and uh, while we were doing the verification like uh, a couple of features were added uh, they are not part of the model so uh, we uh, we may be uh, we may be adding them in the future to uh, to verify they, they work as intended the good uh, good outcomes of the project are a definite confidence boost in the algorithm um, the bugs we found and fixed and um and then some other uh maybe less obvious uh, uh, is um outcome is that we we now have some some kind of a data point for the tool authors so for iris uh, iris folks uh we can uh, we can now report uh pain points and like basically our experience with uh with using iris uh, in an industrial setting so that's um that's all i have uh, in terms of slides as i said i have a i have a couple of spares so um so we can go through go through them if uh, if there's interest uh thanks uh quentin um we have a few minutes so you if you could spend if you want you know two or three minutes on whatever extra slides you you have or yeah. we can move on to question time but i think we have a few minutes if you wanna if you wanna show something that would be yeah. perfectly fine okay let me look at this so i think it, it may be interesting to uh to look uh, a little bit into how the how the queue works i kind of skipped uh over the actual implementation and it's um uh it's uh, it's interesting so so this is the memory layout for the generic queue so it's uh, the queue is uh, is based uh, is a derivative of the classic ring buffer uh, design. So we have two pointers, uh, one for the head of the queue, one for the tail. So the the head is where we are going to enqueue stuff, produce uh, stuff, and the tail is where the the consumer uh, are, the consumers are looking. 
Um, so here the produce uh, end is PC, so the produce counter set to 68 here and the consumer counter uh, set to 58. There's also the, the Q capacity. So in our model, the, the capacity is uh, determined upfront and uh, doesn't change through the Q lifetime. So that's one modification that engineers uh, uh, implemented during the verification is that the, the Q now has some kind of uh, dynamic resizing mechanism, but we, we don't have this in the model. So it's, it's using uh, three arrays. Uh, the first array is where the actual data sits. Um, and that's, that's uh, we're going to give pointers to the user to into this array. The second array is uh, the cell owner array. So it's uh, basically a bitmap that tells whether a consumer or a producer is currently having uh, ownership, uh, quote, quote, uh, of the, um, of the cell and there is also an uh, iteration array so this is uh, the what i call the cell usage cycle so one usage cycle is an nq followed by a dq and every time uh, because um yeah every every time uh, such a cycle completes uh, the iteration array uh, entry gets bumped and these two arrays, uh, as you will have guessed, uh, are used for synchronization purposes. So that's the that's the generic NQ path. Not uh, it, it's not much code. Uh, it's definitely uh, not expected of uh, anyone to try to understand it. But uh, we can go through uh, um, a couple uh, interesting features. So. The, the code is using uh, atomic operations. Uh, like, well, Derek pointed out uh, th this is pseudocode. That's not uh, Iris Heaplang. In Iris Heaplang, you just you just use a load, and kind of all of the memory operations are, are atomic. And um, but uh, here I, I I wrote them down to to kind of uh, remind uh, um, remind the audience that. Uh, those are it's it's important that those are those are atomic operations. Then um, so we load the, the produce counter uh, atomically. We we load uh, some information from the iteration and owner array, and in in a certain order. And I call these these loads optimistic because they may uh, or may not uh, be taken uh, giving a. a a good idea of of uh, of one part of the cell of the of an, of one part of the logical state of the of the queue, and whether they give us a good idea or not is determined by this uh, validation step here. We do a cast operation, compare and swap. Uh, so that's that's a, another atomic operation, uh, the fancier kind, that uh, will update a memory cell if um, if its value is. Uh, is a, a given uh, is the the second argument here. So we will only uh, we will bump PC by one, but only if uh, if it is uh, if its value is what we read in the first load. And this kind of uh, binds everything together. Like if the compare and swap succeeds, it really means that we got a consistent view of the of the cell right at the producer counter, and then we can use it and return a pointer to it. Uh, to the user, so that's uh, that's a zero copy. Yeah, I, I see Derek uh, raise his hand. Uh, yeah, Derek has some questions. <laughs> yeah, I have a couple of questions actually. They're uh, not so much about this particular example, though. It's very interesting. Um, uh, so they're higher level questions. Though. So the first one yeah. is, um, what? Uh, so this all this is very exciting. Uh, what can you give give us any insight as to like where this is work is going? I mean, are you are you planning to actually verify more data structures? Are you planning to verify them at a more you know to a more realistic uh, model of of uh, you know of the code um, or you know what 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 are I some think, of the, the yeah? Data I think we were fairly satisfied really with the, with this model of uh, of. Uh, of staying at the algorithm level, and and there are other opportunities. So we are working with engineers uh, to to find other um, tricky uh, 
parts of the uh, of the operating system where um, where we can apply verification. So that's uh, that's where this is going. We are we are one like other interesting aspects would be to address some of the limitations like the um, like the the liveness or or even in the what is uh, pretty interesting and hasn't really uh, been uh, addressed much in uh, in academia is this aspect of having like one uncooperative end of the data structure so that that would be one one interesting aspect because really uh, for kernel engineers, the, the the biggest pain point is um, they really want to make sure that there is no way the user space can crash the kernel, and that's that's a, a very important property. Now, a phrase like this, it's kind of a, a daunting problem, but we can address it in in parts that are uh, especially tricky, and the engineers knows they know really. Uh, um, the code well, and they, well, they know where uh, where things are, are a bit hairy, and where they they had uh, they had many bugs. The Q implementation, for instance, had multiple uh, multiple iterations. That's the last version of it, but uh, but it went through multiple iterations and uh, uh, with bugs. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. um, my, my second question was. Uh, um, what is if you could say something more about your experience with iris and like you know what was the learning curve like and uh what yeah well what specifically you know do you, do you have specific requests for um things that you know that could fundamentally be improved well i have one request <laughs> um i don't understand why the compliance swap can only act on the integer and <laughs> in the port skew uh because we we are verifying the algorithm, and yeah. so in the parse queue, the program, uh, the producer counter, is uh, is a bit more complex, and in the implementation, it's a uh, it's still a sixty four bit integer, but uh, multiple counters are being packaged. We didn't really want to uh, to bother too much about the bit width of the stuff mm -hmm. and the shift lefts and the masking and so on. So we just wanted to do compare and swap on the on the tuple. And that doesn't work. <laughs> ah, okay, All right, okay. Well, that's, that's, that's kind of a. That's kind of. A, you want to be less that, realistic than. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I want to be less realistic. Okay, fine. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's would be hard to do. I don't think. Um, no, avoid accidental not realism. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's um, yeah, that's one thing. So one thing we one other thing uh, higher level remark is. Um, we found uh, so, for instance, we had to develop some uh, some custom ghost state in Iris, and uh, doing so was like surprisingly not painful. But uh, but then the code proof. So the code proof, you kind of get your idea of how how it's going to go, and then uh, and then you can you just have to like put the work. In, uh, put the work in and uh, and usually uh, i was quite surprised by uh, by the fact that the the parts uh, for which you, you think the most have really short neat proofs and the code proofs are are like bloated and uh, very large mm -hmm. and we 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 had difficulty uh, uh, and but but still extremely mechanic uh, like extremely mechanic you it like mm -hmm. it wasn't it was the first time for me using right. uh, using iris and yeah. And it really felt like a, like programming a machine, really. Uh, and and so I'm tempted to say you 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 expected I expected more help from the machine. <laughs> right. Got it. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Derek. We um, we sort of moved into the discussion uh, yeah. phase before we even got a chance to um, to thank Peter and, and Quentin for their talk. So I, I propose we. Before we take the next question, I see already um, hands raised, but before we take the next question, we first um, give a big uh, thank you to both Quentin and, and Peter. You can unmute yourself. We have this tradition of unmuting um, and actually clapping in this, uh, in this seminar. So you can unmute yourselves and, and clap for, uh, for Peter and Quentin. Very good. 
thank you uh, both and, um, and thanks everyone for, for being here. So now we move on to the discussion section. We'll probably go a bit um, over time, but I'll give the floor to, to Rolf Jung, who has the next question. Rolf, you're muted. Oops, sorry. Yes, good point. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for the talk. It's always nice to see like new ways of iris being being used, and it's always very positive surprises when it's coming from industry in particular. Um, so one thing, so you, I mean, I mean, regarding the thing you just mentioned around the code proofs and having more automation, I think that might be something where it might be good to like um, have some kind of meeting where we could like look at the cock scripts and see what it actually is that you think is mechanic. Like I, I mean, having having worked on some verification here with the people at MIT where they're translating Go code to Iris. I think I have a feeling for what you mean, but that might be something where it could be, it would be good to like, I think have a concrete, mm -hmm. like see, see, have an example um, that we can benchmark on basically. Um, one thing I was wondering is like how, um, I mean, we have for Lambda Rust, we have developed a thing where we do have a distinction between atomic and non-atomic accesses mm -hmm. without having all the pain of weak memory. Um, okay. Is that, like, do you think, do you consider it a big weakness that all the accesses are atomic? Is that something you would be interested in, like doing the verification in a model which has almost the same reasoning principles, but distinguishes atomic and non-atomic accesses? And then, of course, like as an extension of that, Iris, there is a version of Iris for, weak, for relaxed memory. Um, is that something you might look into? Yeah, well, that's, that's definitely one direction where we can, uh we can increase the, the realism of the queue, but but it I got the feeling that the engineers were actually not too keen on being super fancy uh, with uh, weak memory. And um, and so a, a lot of it is uh, synchronized uh, with uh, sequentially consistent atomics. And there are some places where, where they use uh, more relaxed uh, atomics, but... Um, but it's uh, it's very very marginal. So so I'm that's that's definitely one interesting thing. But uh, but maybe for instance the security would be uh, would be more more important to to the OS case. Okay, I see. Thanks. Hey, thanks. The next question by um, Tej Chaget. Yeah, uh, great. Thanks for the thanks for the talk. It, uh, it was really cool. Um, I'm also very happy to see Iris being used in industry. Um, so one question I had is, uh, and for context, I do work on mechanized proofs, but I'm curious if you can compare your experience with knowing what you know now. What would it be? What would it be like if you didn't use mechanized proofs? Like, suppose you really just thought through oh. this very formally. You wrote down some invariants. You done some specs. Maybe you even oh, yeah, used yeah, yeah. Iris as an informal Blackboard language. Um, do you think this would be useful at all? No, you. I think you want to do it. <laughs> Make nice. Okay. <laughs> it's like it's so. We got, we got really intuitions, but uh, but you need the mechanization to to like fill the fill the holes, and and I would really not be confident with. Uh, high level reasoning. There, there are some um, there are some things I learned that uh, I would maybe uh, I, I would apply to uh, when like say if I had to write a log free algorithm, then I would maybe approach it differently now that I I know Iris. Now if I wanted to be confident about the log free algorithm, I think I would have to go to through the, me the mechanization. Okay, in some ways, I mean that's a very good answer for me. <laughs> no, it's like it's it's too subtle. <laughs> it's too subtle. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks, uh, Quentin and, and Peter. Once again, I'm afraid uh, we'll have to uh, stop here. We're a bit over time already. Um, I'm sure Peter and Quentin will be happy to take uh, more questions and by email or um, or other other means, Facebook Messenger, all kinds of other. Otherwise, um, but I, I'm afraid uh, we'll stop here. I will, uh, some people might still hang around. So Quentin, if you have time, maybe you can, can stay for, um, for a couple of minutes. I'll stop the recording right now.